So welcome back from the break. Let's take a look at this question so we can move on. Briefly describe three mechanisms by which bacteria can transfer DNA between bacterial cells. Well, that's what we were discussing in the previous section. So we've got transformation, transduction, and conjugation. So remember in transformation, it's the taking up of DNA from the environment. These could be in the form of plasmids that are free in the environment or um, genomic DNA or fragments of genomic DNA that are in the environment. But it is all about the um, taking up of DNA that's free and loose in the environment. Transduction, remember, involves the transfer of bacterial DNA sequences and specifically genomic DNA sequences via um, bacteriophages as the vector of transfer. So in this case, the bacteriophage mispackages bacterial DNA and transfers that to the new bacterial cell that it's going to infect. So instead of turning the new cell into a, a virus factory, it inserts um, bacterial genomic sequences that get incorporated into the genome of the recipient cell. In conjugation, you've got direct transfer of DNA via the sex pillus in response to the presence of the F factor. If it's in the F plasmid, then it's the transfer of only the F plasmid itself that turns the cell from F minus, the recipient cell from F minus to F plus because of the presence of the F plasmid, but you don't get genomic transfer. To get genomic transfer, the F factor needs to be in the genome of the cell. That cell is referred to as an HFR cell. The recipient cell is still an F minus. Um, when the, pillus form, the sex pillus forms, the genomic DNA is transferred. The recipient cell will try and protect itself from this foreign genomic DNA by cutting it up through its restriction enzyme system but some of those fragments are going to be incorporated into the recipient cell's genome. The F factor does not, it gets um, degraded and lost. So the cell never becomes F plus or HFR, it remains F minus. So could it potentially pick up more genomic material? Absolutely. And so this is how horizontal gene transfer, particularly via um, conjugation, could lead to the accumulation of several genomic factors taken from multiple different types of bacteria into a single species over time. This is how we feel um, aerobic respiration evolved over time and perhaps um, photosynthesis itself, aerobic photosynthesis evolved over time by the accumulation of different components of each of these metabolic pathways that have evolved separately in different cells, but the genes for those processes were transferred by a horizontal gene transfer into a single recipient um, bacterial cell through several conjugation events that led to the eventually a single cell that contained all of the components necessary for aerobic respiration and for oxygenic photosynthesis. So let's move on and talk more about the flexibility of prokaryotic cells. This time we're going to talk about metabolic and nutritional flexibility. So we do recognize um, four modes of nutrition that are found in prokaryotes and represent the four modes of nutrition that are possible in the biosphere as we know it. So in photoautotrophy, um, obviously light serves as the energy source. Bring up the pen again. So light is the energy source. and it reduces CO2. So some of that energy from the light is used to reduce carbon dioxide to organic molecules. I mean, this is photosynthesis. 
Okay, so photo, photo autotrophy is photosynthesis. Um, in chemo autotrophy, you've got chemicals. as energy source. And again, you've got reduction of CO2 using some of that energy. So these would be the sort of bacteria that are living down, or archaea that are living down around the um, thermal vents in the deep ocean. They're tapping into chemicals that are coming out in the hot water, specifically H2S, hydrogen sulfide. But there are bacteria that can do this as well, use H2S, it's not just archaea. Um, we'll look at a list of various electron donors and electron recipients that can be used. In many cases, um, they give rise to different forms of anaerobic respiration that looks like aerobic respiration, except oxygen is not the final electron acceptor. Other chemicals serve as electron acceptors, but you have a full um, cell respiration pathway, it just does not require oxygen to function. So that's another form of um, chemoheterotrophy is where that comes in. So photoheterotrophy, um, light as energy source. And in this case, the light is used to make ATP. and carbon via organics. So these are organisms that need to eat organic molecules to get their source of organics, amino acids, sugars, and lipids and the like, but they get their ATP by harvesting light energy. And in fact, there are um, prokaryotes, both bacteria and archaea, that can do this. Those halobacteria, those purple bacteria that we were looking at previously, the light that will tolerate high salt up to around five times um, seawater, they, that purple pigment is allowing them to capture light energy and generate ATP in response to that. Chemoheterotrophy, this is um, chemicals as energy. carbon from organics. And of course, this would be animals. Do chemo have a trait. But so do prokaryotes. There are prokaryotes that can do this as well. Um, so are there any here that are unique to bacteria or to archaea, uh, to prokaryotes? The answer is yes. So chemoautotrophy and photoautotrophy are both unique prokaryotes. Why not chemoheterotrophy? Because animals do that. Why not phototrophy? because plants can do it as well. It's a plant analogy. So yes, cyanobacteria do photoautotrophy. And the reason why plants and algae can do photoautotrophy is because they contain resident cyanobacteria, the chloroplasts. So that's why plants and algae can do photoautotrophy because they're taking advantage of the their endosymbionts, the chloroplasts that were derived from um, cyanobacteria. Um, chemoheterotrophy, animals do that, fungi do that. But chemoautotrophy and photoheterotrophy, only prokaryotes do that. So those are the two nutritional modes that are unique to prokaryotes. So here you can see, um, some stated examples, you can take a look at this. This comes straight out of the textbook. Um, so take a look at this and you can see um, this for yourself. 
here is a list of different electron donors and electron acceptors. So you can see that oxygen can be used as an electron acceptor. So this would be a form of aerobic respiration, but you can see that there are a number of different types of molecules that can also be used as electron acceptors separately from oxygen. And so these would be forms of anaerobic respiration that mimics aerobic respiration in that it involves um, electron transport pathways, it involves an ATP synthase to make ATP. Um, it's basically very similar to aerobic respiration. It just does not involve oxygen as the final recipient of the electrons that are being derived from the donors. But it still allows the um, prokaryotes to generate significant amounts of ATP, um, but not as much as you would expect to get from oxygen because none of the other receptors are anywhere near as electronegative as oxygen is. Now, what I also want you to pay attention to is fire up the pen again. Uh, these three groups. The reason why I want you to pay attention to these is because these help run nitrogen cycle. And as you are about to discover, the nitrogen cycle is run by bacteria. This is because only bacteria possess the necessary metabolic um, pathways to capture nitrogen, otherwise known as dinitrogen or nitrogen gas from the atmosphere and break the three covalent bonds that exist between the two nitrogen atoms. And out of that produce, depending on the type of bacteria, nitrates, nitrites, or ammonia. But in doing that, they make the nitrogen now available to plants. So these bacteria are responsible for doing nitrogen fixation, taking nitrogen gas and turning it into compounds that plants can take up and use that nitrogen to create amino acids, to make nucleotides, uh, or I should, should back away from that and say nitrogenous bases that will be assembled into nucleotides. In other words, this is how nitrogen enters into the biosphere. It can only be done by bacteria. So some bacteria take the nitrogen and turn it into nitrates, nitrites, and ammonia. Other bacteria, then can break down organic molecules in dead organic material and return the nitrogen in the form of nitrates, nitrites and ammonia back to the soil to be reused. Or in the case of some, convert that to nitrogen gas to be returned back to the atmosphere. Again, it's only the bacteria that can do this. All of the steps of the nitrogen cycle are dependent upon bacteria. This is why I made the statement at the beginning of the presentation that if all the bacteria or the prokaryotes on the planet were to disappear tonight, life would very quickly come to a grinding halt because we would run out of available nitrogen. And once you run out of available nitrogen, there's no other way of getting nitrogen. You are dependent upon whatever nitrogen exists in the organisms, but eventually it's going to turn into forms that can no longer be used. And it has to be taken up by plants because only plants can take, make the amino acids, only plants can make the nitrogenous bases that all other life forms are dependent upon. So once the plants are no longer able to make amino acids and nitrogenous bases, very, very quickly, remaining life forms are going to 
lose their capacity to survive, at least just in the form of life as we know it. So this is another reason why prokaryotes are really central to all of life on the planet. Then in terms of oxygen, bacteria have three different relationships to oxygen, and you can see them listed here. Obligate aerobes, the term obligate means, comes from a root word that means absolute requirement. So an obligate, think of it as this coming from the same root as obligation. Obligation means you have a requirement to do something. So an obligate aerobe has an absolute requirement for oxygen. It cannot survive in the absence of oxygen. So these would be your truly aerobic um, prokaryotes. Facultative anaerobes, of which E. coli is a member, so the member of the gut bacteria that live in E. coli, are happy in the presence of oxygen, but equally happy in the absence of oxygen. So they can flip backwards and forwards between being aerobic or anaerobic. That's why we use the term facultative. They have the facility to be anaerobic if oxygen is absent. If oxygen is present, that's their preference. They like that because they can make more ATP. They can do aerobic respiration. But if there's no oxygen present, they have the facilities to operate anaerobically, and they're equally happy doing that. Then you have the obligate anaerobes. So these have the opposite relationship to the obligate aerobes as far as oxygen is concerned. They hate oxygen. They do not tolerate oxygen. They are killed by oxygen. So their preference is to be in as near oxygen-free environments as they can possibly find. And we'll talk about some archaea, a line of archaea that meet this bill, this description perfectly. And we utilize them, as you'll see. So we talk about nitrogen metabolism, so I'm not going to talk about it again. I'm just going to move on. Then we do see the beginnings of cooperation amongst prokaryotes. Um, you may, depending on when you did your bio one, where you did your bio one. Um, you may have had an opportunity to see anabena either under a microscope or in photographs. Um, when you look at an anabena um, colony, and it is a colony of cells laid out as what looks like beads on a string, all of these are regular anabena cells that are carrying out photosynthesis. But this cell, described as a heterocyst, is doing nitrogen fixation for its compatriots. Oops. Yeah. So this is doing nitrogen fixation. Now, there are some ironies here. requires about 16 ATP per N2 metabolized. Again, this is because of those three covalent bonds. It requires a tremendous amount of energy to do this, but requires absence O2, because the enzymes that do the nitrogen fixation are poisoned by oxygen. So this heterocyst, this nitrogen fixing cell, is in kind of a catch-22 position. It requires a lot of ATP in order to metabolize the nitrogen. That implies aerobic respiration to get that sort of ATP production. But it can't use aerobic respiration because oxygen is, is toxic to the enzymes that do the nitrogen metabolism. So this is where the cooperation comes in. The heterocyst specializes in strictly doing nitrogen fixation. So it doesn't do aerobic respiration at all. In fact, it doesn't do respiration in any form at all. What it does do, however, 
is very effectively picked nitrogen and pass that off to its compatriots in the colony. What those cells do in return is provide the ATP resources that the heterocyst requires to do nitrogen fixation. So you get cooperation between the cells in the colony. So this is a really good example of cooperative cells within a colony. Another form of cooperation is the biofilm that I re referenced back at the beginning of the presentation. And here is dental plant. So you can see bacterial cells, lots of them. These are all bacterial cells. Um, so bacterial cells in the dental block. And then this is dried Saliva and food particles. So if it sounds disgusting and it looks disgusting, that's because it is disgusting in terms of what happens to our teeth. Of course, this is the tooth that is stuck to the enamel, the tooth. Why is this problematic? Because it turns out that these cells, as they metabolize the food, produce acids, and the acids etch the enamel. They eat into the enamel. Enamel is really, really tough. It's one of the toughest materials in the body. But it's easily etched by acidic solutions. And so if you don't remove the bacteria, and if you don't... Um, rinse out your mouth after drinking or eating something that's acidic, you promote the etching of the enamel. Now, some of that can be compensated for by minerals in the saliva, but that's not a perfect solution. The best thing to do is to make sure that your mouth remains relatively neutral in pH. So um, one, of the, one of the issues here is that once the enamel is gone, it never comes back. You can use a synthetic. Most dentists have a polymer synthetic that they can um, squeeze into the etched surface of the tooth. And that will stop the, the breakdown of the tooth and the development of a cavity or something like that. But um, the better solution is not to allow the acids to etch into the enamel in the first place. Hence, brushing your teeth and making sure that you rinse your mouth out if you eat or drink anything that is anything more than mildly acidic and even mildly acidic you need to pay attention to. So colas, orange juice, coffee, beer, wine, and well, particularly beer, not so much wine and spirits, but particularly beer. Anything that's got carbon dioxide dissolved in it um, is going to be acidic in nature. And so you need to protect your teeth against this. So time for another break. Um, this, we've just had a very short period this time, so I'm not going to turn off the recording. I'm just going to answer the um, concept check question. So briefly describe the four major nutritional modes and identify which are unique in, to bacteria. So the four nutritional modes are Photoautotrophy, where light acts as the energy source, and some of the energy is used to reduce carbon dioxide to organic molecules. So it's what plants do, it's what cyanobacteria do, it's what algae do. Then you have chemoautotrophy, where chemicals act as the source of electrons and energy, and are used, and that is then used to reduce carbon dioxide to organics. That is unique to bacteria. Only prokaryotes do chemo autotrophy. Then you have, sorry, yeah, photo autotrophy. Sorry, chemo autotrophy. Let's get it right. Then you have photo heterotrophy, where light is used as an energy source to make ATP, but you need to get your carbon by ingesting organic molecules. That one is also unique to prokaryotes. 
and specifically bacteria. So there are bacteria that can harvest light energy. We talked about the halo bacteria and use that as a way of making ATP. The organic molecules that they ingest are used as raw materials for assembling their own pots, not as a source of energy for making ATP, not their primary source of this. And then you have hetero, um, you have chemoheterotrophy, which involves getting both energy and carbon from the organic molecules that you take in. And that's something that we do. Um, that's something that animals do, fungi do, um, some prokaryotes do it, but it is something that is most notably seen in animals and fungi, non-prokaryotic organisms. So those are the four modes, photoautotrophy, chemoautotrophy, photoheterotrophy, and chemoheterotrophy, the two that are unique to bacteria, uh, chemoautotrophy and photoheterotrophy. So prokaryotic phylogeny is very confusing. It is one of those things that's really difficult to understand. The first thing to remember is that up until relatively recently, about 1973, it was only ever considered that there was a single type, type of prokaryotic cell and those were the bacteria. But in 1973, um, an American biologist or microbiologist actually named Carl Lowe's um, published a paper identifying a prokaryotic cell that had a biochemistry and structural features that were non-bacterial. It was a prokaryotic cell that was clearly not a bacterium. He coined the term archibacteria as a designation for this new type of prokaryotic cell because he was very quickly able to identify a number of other species that fit this bill. Prokaryotic, but definitely not bacteria. Um, this would lead to the demise of the kingdom Monera and ultimately lead to the rise of the three domain system with the two prokaryotic domains, domain archaea and domain bacteria because what were once the archibacteria were eventually um, preferentially named archaea because to add to incorporate the term bacteria into their title kind of suggested that they might still be bacteria. We now know that they are most definitely not. They are very separate from bacteria. So one of the things then became trying to figure out the diversity of what were now two different types of prokaryotes, the bacteria and the archaea. Because remember, all prokaryotic cells were lumped into one group at one point. Now we have to deal with two different types of archaea, sorry, back, uh, prokaryotes. And some of those prokaryotes that are now called archaea were once mistakenly identified as bacteria. So there was a lot of work that needed to be done to try and figure out the um, taxonomy and the phylogeny of prokaryotes. So here is a tentative breakdown of domain archaea and domain bacteria. Four basic clades of archaea and five, six is five, five basic clades of bacteria. Now, within some of these clades, there are subgroups. So in proteobacteria, we have five separate clades designated by Greek letters. Um, in domain archaea, there is some suggestion that perhaps there may be a fifth clade that needs to be designated. Now notice that within this, we've got a polytone right now, where there's three branches rather than two coming from a branch point. So that's a polytone. And that's because it's not clear what the evolutionary relationship is between the three major branches of archaea. And it may be difficult for some time to try and understand what their phylogenetic relationship is. Because the cutting edge work right now in identifying 
new members of these domains does not involve isolation of cells. It involves isolation of genetic material. So if you want to look for the presence of new archaea or new bacteria, and archaea are hot ones right now, you take a water sample and you isolate the DNA. You then use DNA sequencing analysis to identify all known DNA sequences from identified species, whether they be archaea or bacteria, because there are fingerprints, there are DNA fingerprints that identify whether there are, this is DNA from archaea or from bacteria. Once you eliminated all the known ones, what you're left with is new species. And you can then identify from their DNA fingerprints whether they are archaea, whether they are bacteria, and which of the major groups within archaea and bacteria they belong to, all without actually isolating the cells, just by isolating the DNA sequences. So this is um, a hot part of the taxonomic investigation of these two domains, trying to, ident trying to find out how diverse archaea are and also in increase our understanding of the diversity of bacteria. So this is our best understanding. We'll take a look at archaea first and then we'll take a look at bacteria and we'll break the bacteria out a little bit um, so you get a better feel for what's going, for what, what's here. Let's take a look at domain archaea first. So archaea don't just inhabit extreme environments, but the best known archaea are the ones that do inhabit extreme environments. And so these are considered to be extreme thermophiles if they live in very hot, hot environments, extreme halophiles if they tolerate very high salt content, and extreme anaerobes if they prefer um, really oxygen-free zones. These would be the methanogens. So the extreme thermophiles are the ones that inhabit these are the ones that are found around ocean thermal vents. And they can tolerate up to about 140 degrees Celsius is about as hot as it can get. Is what is the highest temperature that's been identified? Extreme halophiles, salt concentrations up to 10 times seawater. So these you'll find in dry salt lakes. And evaporation pans. So an evaporation pan is where they sit, where they take seawater into a shallow pond, seal it off and allow the water to evaporate, and collect the salts over time. So this is the sort of region where you, area that you're gonna find these extreme um, halophiles. And then uh, the notes already given you an indication as to where you can find the methanogens in swamps and marshes. Let me move the transcription box up here because you're going to um, involve, oops. So in water treatment plants where they're processing human sewage, um, 
The first part of the process involves bringing it into an oxygen-free building. So it's a sealed building, oxygen um, levels are kept very low in there. And methanogens um, are present in the waste and they break down the solids in the, in the sewage. And they give rise to methane as a, as a byproduct. In fact, it's methane in swamps and marshes that you see bubbling in the water. That's not oxygen, that's actually methane being produced by the methanogens at, at, in, in the depths of the marshes and the swamps. Um, and it gives that characteristic swamp smell. In fact, methane is sometimes referred to as swamp gas. Now, the methane that's being produced from the, in, from the wastewater treatment, to the best of my knowledge, is not being used for energy production. But um, these are also present. deep in landfills. So the methane is now collected and used in electricity generation. In fact, here in Florida, the University of Florida is working with um, waste management, the big um, landfill management company, particularly down in Polk County, to, to see how they can maximize the production of methane in landfills and maximize the extraction of that methane from landfills. So they've got several research projects going on. Now, previously, I mean, it's been understood that the the methane has been a product of, of landfills for many years now. And it is problematic because the heat generated as a, as, a, as a result of this breakdown, this activity of the methanogens, can sometimes trigger the methane to catch on fire and you get a deep underground fire, which is very, very difficult to put out. And so for landfills, it's been the practice to drive perforated metal rods deep into the landfill, all the way to the base of the landfill, so that you can capture the methane and bring it to the surface. And the, the technique of, the general technique of dealing with it was to just set it on fire. So you would see a flare of uh, a flame on the end of the pipe, burning off all the methane that had been captured from all of these Methane wells, I guess, that have been driven into the landfill to capture methane. Well, methane is actually a relatively clean burning fuel compared to other um, fossil fuels or uh, carbon-based fuels. And so there are a number of companies now. Um, I know Johnson & Johnson does this, Subaru does this, a uh, number of other companies are uh, using methane generated from landfills to generate electricity to, to run their companies, to run their production plants, because the methane would otherwise just be burnt and wasted. Why not use this um, methane that is a natural product of the breakdown of the waste in the landfill and use it to make electricity? It's much cleaner um, for the environment in many different ways. So this is a way in which we can utilize the methanogens. They're not just good for breaking down our sewage, which is a good thing, obviously, but we can now take advantage of the methane that they generate in landfills. And I suspect that people are going to look at sewage plants at some point and start saying, why don't we capture that methane as well and use it for, instead of wasting it um, to generate electricity. So here is a comparison um, of archaea with bacteria and eukarya. And you can see here what one of the problems is with this whole notion of horizontal gene transfer. When you compare bacteria with archaea, 
there are some features that are shared by archaea and bacteria, but there are some that are unique to archaea. When you compare archaea with eukarya, you can see that there are some features that are shared between archaea and eukarya, but some of the features are also unique to archaea. And these similarities are a reflection of horizontal gene transfer. And likewise, you can see similarities between bacteria and eukarya, but we would expect that because our current hypothesis is that eukarya are derived from bacterial ancestral cells. But it's also just as likely that archaea made a contribution through horizontal gene transfer. So this is why when we look at a putative tree of life, the situation becomes really confusing because of having to take into account the horizontal gene transfer that we know has occurred on the basis of gene sequence analysis. When we start looking at bacteria, the situation becomes a little bit more complex because there are five major groups of those that are significant as far as humans are concerned um, in terms of direct interaction with humans causing human diseases. The two most important groups are the proteobacteria and the gram-positive bacteria. Within the proteobacteria, we have the five groups, as I said, identified by Greek letters. So we've got alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. These are representatives of each of them. So rhizobium are the bacteria that form nodules with legumes and do nitrogen fixation for legumes. So bees, peas, and all that. Anything that has um, nodules for nitrogen fixation use rhizobium. Nitrosoma, nitrosomonas is also a nitrogen metabolizing bacterium. Um, Thio margarita namibiensis is a member of a group called the purple sulfur bacteria. This is one that does chemo um, autotrophy. So I'm going to put here. Um, Nitro formation with legumes. This one's involved in nitrogen cycle. This one does chemo autotrophic, it's chemo autotrophic. uses H2S as electron source. And produces elemental sulfur. So the yellow globules inside the cells are sulfur globules. Um, Chondromyces um, croca crocatus belong to a group of bacteria that represents some of the smallest bacteria with some of the smallest genomes that we know of. It's doing that, but it does.
So um, these bacteria are being used as a way of investigating what are the fewest genes necessary to maintain an intact cell? Because they've already got a small genome. So it's not that much of an issue to, to knock out genes to see what effect that has on the cell. Is this a necessary and essential gene or not? Then Helicobacter pylori um, is the bacterium that's responsible for stomach ulcers. When this was first worked out by a microbiologist and a medical doctor working together in Australia. Um, this is a really interesting story. Um, it was based on a, the simple observation by the medical doctor that many of his patients who were being treated for antibiotics or being treated with antibiotics for a bacterial infection were being cured of their stomach ulcer if they also had a stomach ulcer. And as he started to see this um, repeated time and time again, he began to wonder whether um, a stomach ulcer was actually a bacterial infection. Now, at the time, it was considered that no bacterium in its right mind could tolerate the stomach because of the pH 2, which is too acidic. Um, but he got together with a microbiologist who was willing to, to run with him on this one. And they started collecting stomach juice from people with stomach ulcers to see if they could identify bacteria in there. And eventually they identified Helicobacter pylori, um, which was a real surprise to begin with. Then the question became, how do you prove that this is the bacterium that causes stomach ulcers? Well, here they had to apply Cox postulates, which I've got included on a slide a little bit later here in the presentation. But basically, the first part of it is to find the putative pathogen in all individuals who have the condition. And they were able to isolate Helicobacter pylori from the stomach juices of the vast majority of patients who had stomach ulcers. We now say that it's responsible for about 95% of stomach ulcers. There are some stomach ulcers that are caused by other reasons, not by Helicobacter. The second thing, is to be able to culture these bacteria. Now, this became a real challenge because given that they live at pH two, this was such an unusual environment at this point in time that they had to spend a significant amount of time experiment with different types of growth media just to be able to culture the bacteria in isolation. Um, we now know that other bacteria can survive these sorts of pHs in the environment, but this was the first time that a bacterium like this had been discovered in the human body. They eventually were able to culture it. The third part of it was where they really came up against a difficult um, postulate in Cox postulates, because here they have to take the cultured pathogen and give it to otherwise healthy individuals. And because at the time, the dogma with stomach ulcers was once you develop a st stomach ulcer, it was a lifetime um, condition and you had to go on special bland diets and there were all sorts of things you had to do because a, a stomach ulcer was considered to be incurable. And their concern was that they may trigger a stomach ulcer um, using the helicobacter but it may not be the direct cause of the stomach ulcer and they may not be cured, able to cure it again. And they didn't want to be in a position of giving people stomach ulcers that they could never cure. So they did the only thing they could think of. They used themselves as guinea pigs and took doses of Helicobacter pylori and sure enough, they developed stomach ulcers. And then the trick, the fourth postulate is to identify the presence of the pathogen in the individuals, the otherwise healthy individuals that you've now given the pathogen to, they develop the disease that the pathogen is supposed to be responsible for and you isolate that pathogen from these individuals again. So then they took stomach juices from themselves and were able to identify the presence of helicobacter. Then they took the antibiotics and lo and behold, as they were hoping, they were cured of the stomach ulcer. 
when this gave them then the confidence to go ahead and do larger clinical studies, which they did, and then they eventually wrote up a paper to describe this. And they ran into trouble getting it published because this ran in the face of everything that was understood about stomach ulcers. And even after the paper was eventually accepted and published, the medical world was very, very, very resistant to this notion that stomach ulcers were simply a bacterial infection and a two week dose of antibiotics would cure it. Because for so many years, a stomach ulcer was considered to be a lifetime affliction, uncurable, da 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 da. Um, but eventually, doctors started to, to think, well, maybe this is worth a try because so many patients would have stomach ulcers. And what have you got to lose by giving them a two week dose of antibiotics? And it turned out that those doctors that were willing to try it found that their patients were being cured by this two week dose of antibiotics. And so over time, the medical profession came to accept that in fact, the vast majority of stomach ulcers really are the product of a bacterial infection. This was further reinforced when a few years ago, and I'm not sure exactly the year, the two individuals, the medical doctor and the microbiologist were awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine for their discovery of Helicobacter pylori as the primary cause of stomach ulcers. So this is now a very widely accepted idea. In fact, if you come across a doctor that tells you that a stomach ulcer is not a bacterial infection, I'd find another doctor. Because as I said, 95% of all stomach ulcers are known to be the product of dysbacterium. And dysbacterium does live in the stomach of a lot of individuals. You may very well have these bacteria living in your stomach right, right now. Why do they not cause a stomach ulcer? Because your immune system keeps them in check. See, we now know that about 70% of your immune system is associated with your gut. And one of the things that the immune system does is keep the helicobacter in check. So why then does stress lead to stomach ulcers? Because stress be, uh, leads to a suppression of the immune system. And when the immune system is suppressed, helicobacter, like all good bacteria, as opportunists, take advantage and they cause the breakdown of the mucus that lines your stomach and protects your stomach from the acid because they use the mucus as a food source. And so they destroy the mucus lining that allows the acid to get to the cells underlying it. And that's when you have your ulcer because the acid kills the cells. So, um, gastric reflux, when you have heartburn and your stomach juices come up your esophagus, what you feel temporarily there is what leads to the ulcer once the helicobacter digests their way through the mucus because your esophag esophagus does not have that protective layer. So the acid, once it breaks through the little um, muscle layer that's supposed to close off the stomach, the, the top of the stomach, and allows the acid to, to um, rise up in the esophagus, the cells that line the esophagus get burnt by the acid in much the same way as your stomach cells get burnt once that mucus layer breaks down. So if you've ever had heartburn, if you've had um, gastric reflux, you've experienced temporarily what stomach ulcer sufferers used to, it used to experience for years because people did not understand that it was a bacterial infection and could be cured with a handful of antibiotics over the course of two weeks. Then amongst the other groups, we have the chlamydias. Um, most chlamydias that you are probably familiar with are STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, leptospiria, uh, leptospira. I don't think this is the one, but there, but a spirochete is actually the cause of syphilis, another sexually transmitted disease. Oscillatoria is the cyanobacteria, photosynthetic. You've probably seen these before. Streptomyces is gram-positive bacteria. These are kind of cool because if you've ever used streptomycin, 
then you've used an antibiotic produced by the Streptomyces bacteria. And there are multiple species of Streptomyces that make their own unique versions of Streptomycin, different types of Streptomycins. And you might ask, why do bacteria want to produce antibiotics? For the same reason we want to use antibiotics, to kill off the competition. Um, this is a way of keeping the environment to themselves. We've simply figured out how to make these drugs synthetically after extracting them from bacteria. And so we can use these as antibiotics. Of course, if you use and misuse them, you run the risk of, of the onset of antibiotic resistance. So again, another double-edged sword here, taking advantage of bacteria's ability to kill off the competition through their own antibiotics. But when we start using them, we increase the likelihood of the emergence of antibiotic resistance. And then mycoplasmas. Um, you, if you look at this and you think the purple stain thing is the mycoplasma, well, no, it's the little white spots. These are incredibly tiny cells. Um, again, these also contain some of the smallest genomes that we know of. These are also part of the study to try and find out what is the minimum number of cells necessary to maintain a functional cell. So what are the roles of, eukaryote, of prokaryotes in the environment? After all, our interaction with prokaryotes tends to suggest that the only thing that they do is cause disease. And that's because about half of all human diseases are caused by bacteria. But as you, I hope you've gained an appreciation of, there are real roles for prokaryotes in the environment. Just think about their role as the operators of the nitrogen cycle, their role in breaking down organic waste, all sorts, whether it be in the landfill or sewage, um, as decomposers. Um, they decompose their own bodies once we, once we die. They are decomposing all sorts of dead material over time, and they're returning all of that good organic material back into the environment to be recycled back into organisms. So they are clearly central to the operation of the biosphere. In fact, the biosphere could not operate without the presence of the prokaryotes. So we've just, I've just talked about that. So here's an example. And you can see here that amongst these plants, just the presence of some bacteria in the soil improves their ability to pick up potassium. Why focus on potassium? Because potassium is a particularly difficult um, major nutrient for plants to take up from the soil. They struggle to get potassium out of the soil. In fact, this is a reason why plants have um, symbiotic relationships with fungi, because the fungi can help them mobilize potassium out of the soil. When I was doing my PhD in Australia, one of my colleagues, one of my fellow PhD students, was looking at a fungal relationship between some large eucalypts called black butts that were growing on sand dunes and the fungi and the bacteria that were allowing them to grow on these sand dunes because they were mobilizing potassium. Potassium is one of the three macronutrients contained in fertilizers. So if you look at a fertilizer, you see the letters N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Potassium is the one that is most difficult to get out of the soil. So anything that can aid the plants in, get, in mobilizing potassium and getting it out of the soil will allow the plants to grow better. And you can see the effect of the bacteria on the growth of these plants because it allows them to obtain the potassium that they need to continue to grow and to grow more, more effectively. Then you have all sorts of symbiotic relationships. We recognize three of them. Mutualism, where both organisms benefit. Commensalism, where one organism benefits and the other is basically neutral, no harm or no benefit. And then parasitism, where one organism harms possibly kills um, the other organism. I know the book's, book and my notes say, does not kill its host, 
but um, my reading suggests that killing the host can be part of parasitism as a parasite. It does not necessarily have to allow the host to remain alive immune. So here's an example of um, mutualism. So these are these fish, this fish belongs to a family of fish called flashlight fish. And you can see why it's called flashlight. It's got this pocket of light emitting tissue. That's actually the product of um, bacterial activity. So this is um, bioillumination a product of bacterial activity producing a producing fluorescence and it allows the fish to um, see in what would otherwise be a dark environment because this is a deep ocean fish. You can also see that there are pockets of bacteria down the um, region of the backbone in the fish, um, identifying its spinal region. Um, also the region of the lateral line, a pressure sensing um, organ that all aquatic organisms like fish and sharks, even the tadpoles of frogs and um, salamanders all, uh, all possess this lateral line to, to detect pressure waves in the water. Why does it do this? Well, it can, it can be doing it for one of two reasons, to attract food, to attract prey, or to attract mates. Either way, it is a double-edged sword because yes, you may attract a mate, you may attract something to eat, but you're also attracting something that wants to eat you. So it has its pluses and minuses. And it's a, it's a um, compromise as most things are in evolution. So this is our last break before the end of the slides because the next break is right at the end of the presentation. So I will stop this one. Yeah, I will stop this one because it's been a little while since we, we had a full break. There are not too many more slides to go, but I will stop this one and then come back again after the break. So here's the concept of question. Although small bacteria are considered by many biologists to be the most successful organisms on earth, how could you justify this? This is a really interesting question. So I'll answer this on the other side of the break. See you shortly. <laughs> 